So today in this video, I'll be showing you the basics of the CT scan PNS and the CT scan orbit as well. So a lot of juniors uh, I've seen, they still struggle with the basic anatomy uh, on the CT scan. They just, uh, they, they kind of try to operate on the patient uh, and they just have a look at the CT scan, but they really struggle to find the basic anatomy of the uh, the CT scan in terms of the anatomy, the landmarks and uh, various important neurovascular structures and certain bony canals and foramens. Uh, so the, the, the basic concept is before you go for the surgery, uh, you need to know the basic concepts of a CT scan because CT scan acts as a, a roadmap, basically a Google map, basically it acts as uh, for you, it guides you to your surgery. Uh, also during your surgery, you need to plan uh, the basic uh, the, the steps in surgery depending on the anatomy which you see on the CT scan. So you got to have the hard copies in front of you on the view box in your OTOR uh, while you're performing a surgery because you cannot just look at the CT scan before surgery and mug it all up. You can just know the basics of it, keep in your mind but you have to have hard copy as well and you need to know each and every basic anatomy uh, once you are in the OR, okay? So I'm just going to go through the most basic anatomy of the CT scan uh, along. So I'm going to talk about both the, the PNS and as well as the orbit because we uh, as ENT and skull based surgeons encounter a lot of cases of uh, sinonasal infections which lead to eventually the uh, the orbital infection, which could be extraconal or intraconal. So you also need to know the basic anatomy of the orbit. Obviously, uh, you're gonna have a discussion uh, with your radiologist because they are the experts in uh, reading the scans, but the reports which they give you for a patient before any surgery, that report is definitely, I would say personally, not very, you know, helpful but as a surgeon you always should know the basics of the uh, anatomy on the CT scan because if you're a surgeon you have to know the scans if you do not know the scans you should not operate in the OR if you're operating without knowing the scan trust me it's a waste of time so I'm gonna talk about the most basic details from uh, a surgeon's point of view okay so I'm gonna this is basically a plain scan so if you get a patient so if you're a surgeon and starting your private practice or your institution as a junior resident or in your residency phase or you're just a, a newly passed a MS or a, a DLO candidate and you do not know how to read a CD scan so here are the basic points you should uh, know about so the first point is that always ask for a scan which will show you all the three sections. That is the coronal, which you can see right now in front of you on the screen. The second is the axial and third is the sagittal because all these three are very, very important. Okay. They are really important. You cannot skip any of those. You have to know the patient in all the in all dimensions, right? So if you get a case of the most simple case for us being the uh, the ethmoidal sinusitis, that is the allergic uh, rhinosinusitis with polyps and bilateral ethmoid or pansinusitis, or you can get a case of AC polyp, uh, you should know on the scans the, uh, the extent of the disease as well. But before that, you need to know the anatomy, right? Because if you go inside and you open up the patient uh, intra uh, endonasally, uh, you should not have any surprises regarding the skull base anatomy, the CSF leak, or any aberrant uh, internal carotid artery or the presence of the onary cell, which you're not aware of. If you're opening the spinoid sinus, you can just damage the patient's optic nerve. So if you're operating for a case of ethmoidal polyposis and you just open the spinoid and damage the patient's optic nerve, that's a disaster, right? So the basic thickness which you should be asking for is 0 0.5, 0 0.6, at least 1 mm should be the thickness of the scan okay if you have such uh, thin scans basically you're gonna you you'll be able to see all the important uh, neurovascular structures such as the anterior ethmoidal artery 
the uh, dyacinths, if at all, present in the skull base, uh, mostly in the anterior ethmoids or near the cripiform plate, the medial and the lateral lamella, all the anatomy you will be able to see. Also, the dyacinths, if at all, present in the cases of uh, sinonasal infections going into the orbit, you can have a look at the dyacinths of the lamina papyracea as well. Okay, so I, I'm going to begin with the, 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 the most uh, anterior part. So I'm going to go from the very front to the very back. Let me just uh, come to the very front part. Okay, so if you get a scan after having a thickness of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 up to 1 max to max. Okay, second step would be you're going to choose the coronal first. Do not go to axial directly. Do not go to sagittal directly. The first section you need to be uh, seeing the scan is the uh, the coronal scan because this is basically the surgeon's view. You're going to operate in the coronal view. Once you understand that, then go ahead with the axial and the, uh, the sagittal. Okay, so I'm going to start with the very first point. So before I start, uh, there's one more video which I had done for the uh, CT scan, but that was uh, in this video, I'm showing you the, the DICOM view, right? The dynamic view, but there's the first video which I had performed on the YouTube channel uh, showing the basic anatomy of the CT scan was in a hard copy view. If you want to go look, have a look at that, you can, I, can, I can post the link for that video over here. That video got a very good response. It has around 20,000 views. So you can just go and have a look at that video. This video, I'm going to show you as a dynamic city scam. So the first point, I'm going to start from the very, very, very anterior part. Okay, so here we go. This follow my cursor all the time. So what you can see over here, this is a coronal section. I'm going to go through the anatomy. And then as we go ahead, I'm going to talk about the uh, the disease or the various surgical procedures you can perform. And what is the, uh, the, the importance of the landmark in each segment I'll be talking about. So the very front part, you can see this uh, grayish soft tissue shadow. This is basically the uh, forehead skin. Okay. So a lot of people confused in the fact that, see, I'm going to tell you why, where, what, what place people get confused. Okay. So I'm going to go behind. I'm going behind. Okay. So what you can see over here, the hyper intense, uh, the bright white uh, structure over here is nothing but the, the nasal bone, which you see at the very front part. This is a forehead skin, which you can see. That's the nasal skin, which you can see over here. And you can see a glimpse of the most anterior part of the nasal septum, which is basically the cartilage part. You cannot have any bony structure over here, except for the nasal bone. Okay. So uh, even the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid here is not visible. So if you can imagine the very anterior part, you're going to have only the nasal bone. You can actually physically touch uh, your nasal bone with your finger and you can feel that it's only the nasal bone which you can see at the very front part and the forehead skin and the, the cartilage which you can see in the nasal septum. So as we go behind, this is what I'm going behind. You can actually see one more bright white uh, structure coming behind. That is the frontal bone. Okay. So the second bony structure, which you can see right now is the frontal bone. You can still see the frontal skin over here. Still, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid is not visible. So you got to keep that in mind. As I'm going behind, 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 you can still see that same frontal bone and you can see some pneumatization, uh, a cell coming into the picture right now. And still you can see the nasal bone, but now the nasal bone is kind of becoming uh, it's it's becoming more uh, long, right? It, it is elongating on both sides, and this will eventually form the, the the frontal process of the maxilla. I'll tell you how. So I'm going behind. You can still see the cartilage of the septum. You do not see any perpendicular plate of the ethmoid so far. So I'm going behind. What you can see right now, it's a huge pneumatization on the left side so on the left side this should be ideally uh, a case or this should be a frontal sinus okay this should be ideally the left frontal sinus but so far we do not have any confirmation on the right frontal sinus uh, you can actually see this patient has a, uh, a nasal bone fracture along with the frontal process of the maxilla so this you can actually see there's a minimally displaced fracture over here so you can have that 
as well uh, for your knowledge. Still the cartilage you can see over here that's the nasal septum you can actually see the left frontal sinus uh, which we will be confirming later on again. So as we keep on going behind you can still see that this is becoming larger. Still, there is no evidence of any right-sided frontal sinus. And now you can actually start seeing the actual frontal process of the maxilla over here. So this elongated process is actually the frontal process of the maxilla. And if I go behind, you could see this was the nasal bone which is the most uh, posterior part of the nasal bone, which you can see a fracture over here. And you can see a little bit of dyscence. You cannot say dyscence, but a, uh, a hairline fracture maybe over here. And then this is the uh, frontonasal process of the maxilla. You can still see some sort of soft tissue shadow over here and a minimally displaced fracture segment, which is in continuation. If we still keep going on behind, you can see the uh, the nasal septum, the quadrangular cartilage, but then still there is no perpendicular plate of the ethmoid visible. Now I'm going behind. Now you can see some shadow over here in the right side, but you can see a huge left frontal sinus. Still, now the question I was talking about that the place where a lot of people get confused is that whether it is actually the frontal sinus or the four, uh, there is a four brain that is the frontal lobe. You can see the brain is not yet come into the picture right now. So a lot of confusion lies there. So they can they, they get confused whether it is the frontal sinus or the frontal part of the frontal lobe. Yes, I've actually seen and I've I've seen uh, residents or junior people actually getting confused with that uh, point over there. So as we keep on going behind. Now you can see soft tissue shadow appearing of the right globe. That's the right eye basically. I'll tell you uh, as we keep on going behind, you'll see the right eye becoming more prominent over here. So still you can see the nasal uh, septal cartilage, the frontal process of the maxilla. This would be somewhat I would say as the frontal beak. Okay. And you can start seeing now the frontal sinus as a small pneumatization area and the left frontal sinus is very huge. Now, why am I saying this is a frontal sinus? Because as we all know, whatever you see as jet black is all air and whatever you see as white hyper intense structure, which is like bright is always bone. And you can see all the soft tissue over here. It is basically uh, will be iso intense to the brain inside so i'm going behind you can actually see a part of the right eyeball coming into the picture right now still that's the frontal process of the maxilla that's the nasal septal cartilage no perpendicular plate of the ethmoid visible and you can start seeing the right side frontal sinus which is as compared to the left pretty small that's the frontal beak area still that's the frontal bone we do not see brain as of yet and you can see a small soft tissue not a soft tissue basically a small bony shadow over here and that is a bright area that could represent uh, the the maxillary bone which on which the the nasal septum is attached the maxillary crest mostly so we're going behind you can see somewhat of uh, bone marrow over here okay let me just try to focus that yeah so you can see this is all bone marrow over here uh, and you can see that's the right frontal that's the left frontal left is pretty big that's the frontal beak over here uh, that's the right soft tissue of the right eyeball that's the cartilage frontal process of maxilla frontal beak you can have a glimpse of the left eyeball right now that's the maxillary bone attachment to the septum right there. So this is basically a bony window I'm trying to show you. This is not a soft tissue window. This is a bony window because you can actually see the bone marrow, the, the proper structure of the bone much more clearly as compared to the soft tissue right there. So keeping on going behind, behind, you can still see there is no brain shadow over here. The brain is not in the picture yet. This is still the bone. 
once this bone is done, posteriorly you will start seeing the brain. You can have a glimpse of the eyeball right now and still the frontal process of the maxilla. You can see the bulbous uh, swelling on the, the nasal cartilage and you can right now start seeing a glimpse of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid coming in the picture right now. That's the frontal beak, okay? Because this frontal beak has a huge importance when you're trying to open the frontal sinus. It always acts as a constant uh, landmark, the anterior landmark for you to enter in the frontal sinus, which I've always uh, shown in my face surgeries. So going behind, nothing, nothing much more on this scan. Let's go behind. You can see all the, the bone, internal uh, structure of the bone over here this maxillary part getting more prominent you can see the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid much more clearly right now and that's the right orbit that's the left orbit you can see the eyeball coming in the picture and that's the bulbous part of the nasal septum this is this is you can consider as important while in cases of septoplasty but you can see there's no bone over here this is purely cartilage so if you want to decongest the area this may decrease the swelling may decrease if you try to decongest that with your decongestions okay so still going on behind it's still the same structure becoming more prominent you can still see this perpendicular plate of the ethmoid going behind going behind and now what you can see over here now this is brain okay now this has to be brain because this is a soft tissue and this is iso intense basically so this is the eye, that's the eye, that's the brain coming in the picture right now and the bone is going to disappear completely. Still the same structure, you can see the maxillary area over here. So keeping on going behind, you can still see the frontal sinus now, the right and the left frontal sinus, the nasal process, the frontal process of the maxilla and uh, this is the maxillary bone and then this is the, the brain, we, as we know this is a brain. Uh, going behind this is the brain on the left side that's that's pretty common to us right now the bone is disappearing and in some time the entire bone is going to disappear and we're going to have a clear picture of the entire forebrain that is the frontal lobe okay so same thing over here now uh, in some time we're going to start seeing the, the the appearance of the maxillary sinus as we see the glimpse of the maxillary sinus, one interesting thing is going to happen is that the frontal sinus is going to disappear, the, the frontal floor is going to disappear, and eventually the frontal recess will start. So I'm going to show you how to identify the beginning of the frontal recess and where, where you should stop to call it as frontal sinus. Okay. Now if I go very back, all this is frontal sinus and this was the intact frontal beak right so i'm going behind i'm still going behind i'm still going behind and still seeing that this is the frontal floor that's the frontal beak is still intact so this 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 structure is still intact so this is definitely the frontal sinus now as long as this floor is intact this will be the frontal sinus now i'm going to go behind and i'm going to show you that's the brain right there and you can see the glimpse of the, the very most anterior part of the maxillary sinus right there but we are now too posterior so I'm gonna go come back very anterior and you can see the very glimpse of the maxillary sinus starting over here but then we can have a look at the frontal sinus the floor is pretty much intact that's the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid in the nasal septum that's the bulbous nasal septal, uh, the, the mucopericondrum area. You can decongest that. You can see a slight deviation, uh, the bony deviation of the septum right here. So floor is still intact. That is basically still the frontal sinus. Nothing extra on this, on this plane. Uh, going behind, you can still see it is pretty much intact. I would still call this as frontal sinus. This patient has a huge sinus basically. Uh, going behind again, again, you can still see it is intact, still intact. I would call this as frontal sinus, but the most posterior aspect of the frontal sinus. 
and you can see over here that's the brain so if you are in the frontal sinus if there's a frontal sinus mucosal or basically some kind of invasive fungal sinusitis or, or basically a traumatic case you can have a dehiscence on this uh, bone of the frontal sinus you can have meningoencephalocele popping out from this area uh, which you have to then combine your endonasal and the external frontal approach to have a CSF leak repair right here. Okay, for that you may also go for a unilateral or a bilateral a draft procedure, maybe a draft 3 that is a modified Lothrop to have an easy access and with the combined endonasal and the external approach, SOS external approach, you can just seal the entire CSF leak. Okay, so keeping on going behind now we can start seeing that the floor is kind of going away it's fading off i'm still going behind now you can see that is basically the complete disappearance of the floor of the sinus and this marks the beginning of the frontal recess okay so that is basically the frontal recess so once the floor of the sinus is gone this is basically frontal recess okay so as long as the floor is there you will call it as frontal sinus and at the moment you see the floor is gone you will call that as frontal recess okay you, you don't have to get confused at all in this step so i'm still going behind i'm going behind you can see there is no floor and this is all frontal recess but then this is the most posterior part of the frontal recess and I can see this is the most initial part of the maxillary sinus. So there's a common uh, the protocol. I wouldn't say it's a protocol, but uh, I would say something like a dictum, uh, a common logic that we've seen all these years in the CT scan is that as soon as the maxillary sinus starts appearing, the frontal sinus fades off. Okay. And if you keep on going behind, if you keep on going behind, if you see that the maxillary sinus is appearing more and more bigger and still you can see something like a frontal recess behind Re i'll repeat this okay uh, if you see the maxillary sinus becoming more and more big in appearance uh, and if you still see something like the frontal recess mind my word frontal recess and not the sinus if you see still something like the frontal recess that has to be definitely a supraorbital opening that is a supraorbital cell or a supraorbital recess, definitely. And if you see, this is a very small supraorbital recess, probably not too big because we can actually start seeing the cupriform plate and the crystalli over here. Whenever you see a cell like this, that's the frontal recess lookalike cell or structure, and you still see the cupriform plate and the crystalli. Trust me, that has to be a supraorbital cell and nothing else. Because the cribriform plate and the crystalli is always and always, always in all humans, posterior to the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. Mark my words. These structures, that is a cribriform plate and the crystalli will be always never ever but it will be always behind the posterior wall or the part where the frontal sinus ends it will be behind that so if you see this is a medial lamella that's the lateral lamella of the cupriform plate and you can see the attachment of the middle turbinate over here which i'll explain that in some time but i'm talking about the the frontal recess anatomy over here so this has to be definitely a supraorbital cell or a supraorbital recess that's for sure so now we can see the appearance of the maxillary sinus which i'll come on to a little bit late but uh, as you know i'm going structure wise so the first structure was the frontal sinus you can see this is the interfrontal septum sometimes you can have a air cell which could be opening uh, in either of the sinuses that is the interfrontal cell which has to open in either of the two uh, left or right cannot open in both of them you can see the intrafrontal sinus septate this is the inter so this is the inter and this is the intra 
septations of the sinus okay uh, you can see the floor is there perpendicular plate of the ethmoid so this section is clear I hope all of you understood what I was talking about the frontal sinus and the recess okay so going behind now the second structure after the understanding of the frontal recess frontal sinus supraorbital anatomy uh, would be definitely the nasolacrimal duct system okay uh, a lot of people do not know where exactly the nasolacrimal duct is actually uh, let me just orient you to the very anterior scan so I always say in all my uh, all my uh, videos on the CT scan of PNS and the orbit is that whenever you want to find the nasolacrimal duct system always look it on the coronal scan and the axial because they both show you the best views for the, uh, the nasolacrimal duct and always always follow the frontal process of the maxilla don't go anywhere else don't don't rush into find the nasolacrimal duct you'll never find it but if you find it with the help of the uh, the frontal process of the maxilla you will always 100% see the nasolacrimal duct for sure see I'm going to show you how so if you're on the very anterior part if you're going behind behind you got to stay focused on the frontonasal process of the maxilla keep on going behind as much as you want do not matter at all do not worry you can just keep on going behind 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 see I'm still going behind I'm still going behind I'm still going behind and now I can see the appearance of the maxillary sinus the most anterior part this is the lateral nasal wall the lateral nasal bony wall and what you can see over here inside the so it is outside the lateral nasal wall and inside the orbit okay so medial to the orbit but lateral to the lateral nasal wall you can see this is the agarnasa air cell so the nasolacrimal duct you will find always if you keep on following your frontal process of the maxilla it's very easy very easy some people go and find the agarnasi air cell and then try to find the nasolacrimal duct that can also work but sometimes a patient may have some kind of sinusitis they won't be able to see the agarnasi cell they may confuse the agarnasi with the uh, the bullet modalis uh, for which also I show you how to exactly differentiate between those two so there's one point <clears throat> so just just very very carefully listen to this you can see this is the frontal floor that's the that's the uh, the frontal beak area so as I go behind as soon as the frontal beak that is the frontal floor this starts disappearing you can see a cell appearing over here and a cell appearing over here if I still keep on going behind you can see the floor is going away it's it's disappearing but you can see a cell over here the moment the frontal floor disappears that is the frontal recess starts whatever cell you see in that area has to be 100% agar nasi air cell it cannot be cannot be any other cell that's for sure if you look it very closely this is the agar nasi cell this is the agar nasi cell it cannot be any other cell it cannot be bulla ethmoralis because your middle turbinate is also not in the picture right now this is the most anterior cell which you can ever see on a CT scan after the frontal sinus okay so this is agar nasi air cell you can see one more cell above you can see one more cell above that could be the Coons type 1 which I'll come on to later on so so this is how the basic you need to remember that this is agar nasi air cell so people find the agar nasi air cell and then you can see the nasolacrimal duct is right there so that is also a perfect way to find the nasolacrimal duct but what if there is a lot of sinusitis over here a polyp you won't be able to see the agar nasi air cell you won't be able to see the frontal recess very clearly but if you have to see the nasolacrimal duct you got to follow the frontal process of the maxilla which never gets eroded in a simple case like sinusitis or ethmoidal polyposis in cases of invasive fungal it could be but 
it's it's a different chapter for that so keep on following the the nasal uh, the frontal process of the maxilla and the moment you see the appearance of the maxilla the anterior most part you can see something like an elliptical oval shape soft tissue over here that is basically the nasolacrimal sac now if i'm going to go posteriorly keep on seeing how it goes inferiorly and see it goes inferiorly inferiorly and then it opens up here in the inferior meatus now we all know as ENT and skull base surgeons that this is the inferior turbinate that's the inferior turbinate bone if you elevate or medialize the inferior turbinate you will be able to see the valve of hasner that is basically the opening of the nasolacrimal duct into the lateral nasal wall and see if i'm going behind you can see that is the nasolacrimal sac that's the lacrimal sac and if i'm going behind behind you can see follow my cursor follow my mouse over there you can actually see the nasolacrimal duct and then you can see the nasolacrimal duct opening over here in the inferior meatus so this is how you definitely see for a nasolacrimal duct system now what is next uh, we finished off the frontal anatomy we finished off the uh, the nasolacrimal duct system on the coronal scan um uh, the third most important thing should be the i'll go with the nasal structures so the septum we can see over here that's the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid becoming more and more long that's the inferior turbinate that's the inferior turbinate so i'll go with the turbinates right now whatever you can see endonasal intranasal i'll go with that so going coming back to the very most anterior part see as long as the frontal sinus was in picture the frontal bone that is the frontal floor was intact we were calling that a sinus the moment the sinus floor disappears that is basically the appearance of the frontal recess and the most anterior cell the moment we see that the frontal recess is coming in the picture we can see something which we call it as an air cell and that is basically the agar nasi air cell now what is agar nasi air cell agar nasi air cell is nothing but the pneumatization of the the lacrimal bone basically theory suggests that it is basically nothing but the pneumatization of the lacrimal bone so you can see the lacrimal bone over here so that is basically a pneumatization of the lacrimal bone which you can see on both sides so depending on that we have though that coon uh, coon's classification which i'll be talking about a little bit later now this is agar nasi air cell this is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid you can see a huge bulbous uh, nasal septal covering over here which you can decongest so far i cannot see any bony deviation so far so this patient shouldn't require any septoplasty so far at least on this scan that's the inferior turbinate just beginning you can see right there the bulbous part that's the the maxillary crest attachment you can see a small spur at the very floor part of this now going behind that's the nasolacrimal duct on the left side so going behind you cannot you can see only the inferior turbinate uh you, you still cannot see the middle turbinate as of yet you can see the agar nasi cell still in the picture you can definitely see a cell above as well and the cell above as well so this is definitely coons type 1 i'm so sure that this has to be coons type 1 going behind going behind now you can have a glimpse of the middle turbinate right here the most anterior part of the middle turbinate if i keep on going behind you can keep on going behind you can see now that the crista gelai has come in the picture right now and you can start seeing the actual part of the the cribriform plate coming in the picture right now why so this is maxilla and this is a cribriform plate and this is a crista gelai this now cannot be frontal recess if you call this frontal recess trust me you are wrong so uh this has to be either a supra orbital continuation of the frontal recess behind and you can see the medial lamella i can just zoom this you can see this is a medial lamella that's the lateral lamella and that's the fovea area this area is called as fovea ethmoidalis okay that's the straight perpendicular plate of the ethmoid with no deviation so far that's the pneumatization you can see in the crista gelai and this looks like a pneumatization of the crista gelai i guess 
So keep on going behind. You can see the straight structure over here. That's the middle turbinate. So what we saw so far was the inferior turbinate, the inferior turbinate bone. You can actually see the hypertrophy. You can see you can you can actually appreciate a slight, very 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 slight deviation to the right side of this patient of the nasal septum. You can see the agar nasa is still there. So agar nasa is still there. It's a huge cell. In the moment you can see that's the middle turbinate appearing over here and that is attached to basically the junction of the medial lamella you can see over here and that's the lateral lamella so the junction is right here the junction is right here so if we keep on going behind behind now what you can see over here is basically the the cell which i'll show you much more clearly now i i need to show you the unsinned process basically so what you can see over here now if we I have gone more posterior right now. You can see the maxilla is a triangle shape right now. And you can see the inferior turbinate, the, the, the bulky inferior turbinate. Slight deviation now you can appreciate on the patient's right side. That's the middle turbinate. Still, you can see the, uh, so the middle turbinate has basically three parts. Okay, we all know the anterior, middle and the posterior. The anterior one third is basically a uh, sagittal section. So basically the orientation of the anterior one third is sagittal. It means it is almost like a straight line. As I will be keeping on going, as I keep on going behind, I'll show you that in some time. So see, this is the anterior one third, the anterior most part of the, the middle terminate uh, with the attachment at the medial and the lateral lamellae of the cribriform plate. Now, if I keep on going behind, I'm going to show you the middle terminate division right now. You can see this is a bulla et modalis. This is a bulla et modalis right now. So if I go f in front, this was all agar nasi cell complex. Okay. But if I'm going behind, if I'm going behind, now this is the initiation of the, the bulla et modalis right there. This is the largest anterior et modal air cell. We all know that. So whenever we going, uh, doing a face surgery, this is the biggest uh, ethmoidal air cell we encounter. So in both the sides, the middle turbinate is definitely not bullous. So there is no concabulosa in this patient. But this was the uh, the uh, the bulla ethmoidalis cell over here. So that's the unsinate process. So I'm going to basically talk about these structures in detail but now I'm focusing on the middle turbinate right now so this is a middle turbinate so this is still the anterior one third now concentrate as I'm going behind this middle turbinate no longer will be attached to the junction of the medial and the lateral lamella of the cribriform rather that rather than that it will be curving away from it you can see the curvature already starting to happen that's the huge bulla et modalis if I'm going behind, behind, I'm still going behind. You can see the curvature of the middle turbinate. Now behind the bulla, it will become completely horizontal. The, the middle turbinate will turn behind the bulla as completely horizontal and will go on to the, uh, will go on, on the lateral aspect and attach itself on the lamina papyracea right here. That's the lamina we all know. So this is still the bulla et modalis, the large cell you can see over here, that's the bulla et modalis. This on the left side is bulla et modalis. So we have to be very clear what is bulla et modalis, which is more posterior, and what is agar nasi air cell, which is kind of more anterior. So these two cells, they obviously are going to change the dimensions of the frontal recess from anterior and posterior respectively. Okay. So this is still the bulla et moralis. Do not confuse with this as the unsinate process. Unsinate is this one, and this is a middle turbinate. So now I'm going again behind. This is still the bulla. You can see this is the, the anterior one third of the uh, middle turbinate. Now it's going behind. You can see it's going behind it, taking a lateral turn over here. You can see that's a lateral turn, which the uh, the middle turbinate is taking right now. If I still keep on going behind, you can still see. You can still see. You can see it's a lateral turn it's taking. Now you can see the the middle turbinate is 
almost taking a lateral turn and you can see that's the middle turbinate which is going and attaching itself on the lamina papyracea right there so that is basically the uh, the ground lamella which we call as that's the basically horizontal or the middle one third of the middle turbinate that separates the anterior ethmoidal with the posterior ethmoidal and that we call as ground lamella which we encounter it always in a case of fist so if it's a case of severe polyposis you may not find the ground lamella because it is already undergone polyposis and you may not even know about it so i'm still going posterior i'm still going posterior you can see the faint attachment i'm still going posterior as you can see we haven't yet encountered uh the superior turbinate right there okay we can i think we just have a glimpse of the superior turbinate right here but very faint if i'm going still behind behind you can see the attachment over here and you can see that's the superior turbinate right there that's the superior turbinate i'm still going behind let me just zoom this out for you so i'm going behind behind you can see the actual uh, attachment it's still going behind now this is a most uh this is i'm going behind i'm going behind okay so okay we were here sometime back now i'm going behind you can see the superior turbinate and then you can see the middle turbinate now is attached completely somewhere else it's not attached over here anymore now we are almost in the posterior part of the maxillary sinus and you can see this is the uh the middle turbinate so inferior turbinate middle turbinate and that's the superior turbinate all the three turbinates seen in one picture but you can see now the middle turbinate is definitely not attaching to any structure of the lamina over here but rather it is attaching itself to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone what is this bone in the lateral nasal wall right now this is basically the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone behind which you're going to encounter the spino palatine foramen right this is you can see this is the inferior orbital fissure which has three directions and three connections which i'll show you later on so this is the superior turbinate so this is how the middle turbinate divides into three parts that is the anterior one third which is in the sagittal section the the middle one third which is also called as a ground lamella which turns from medial to lateral hence it is seen uh, or called as a coronal uh, section and then the the most posterior part you can see this is the most posterior one third attachment on the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone and this is called as the axial section okay so always remember these basics so just near this area you will see if you go posteriorly the posterior uh, spinopalatine canal behind the posterior wall of the maxilla so this was all about the 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 basic anatomy of the the three turbinates which we see sometimes you can see the supreme turbinate but i don't think so i can see it in this case this is a superior turbinate but i don't think so i can see a supreme turbinate over here no i don't think so so you can see the the perpendicular plate of the palatine and this is how it's curling behind and that's the middle turbinate posterior most one third attachment and now you can see the posterior wall is uh, done over here now you can see a coena area and that's the spinoid initiation that's a spinoid bone completely the the lesser wing over here that's the lesser wing over here and this is basically the greater wing of spinoid i'll come to that later on so basically this was the anatomy of the middle turbinate and the inferior turbinate and the superior turbinate now i'll be talking about the so we finished frontal the floor of frontal the agronasi the coons basic how it is in detail i'll talk about it later a little bit so now the lacrimal duct was done the three turbinates done the septum done uh now the cribriform plate yeah so i'll talk about the cribriform plate as we all know so far that the frontal sinus was anterior to the cribriform plate and the cribriform plate is completely posterior 
to the posterior wall of the frontal sinus. So the moment you see the appearance of the crista galli right now, this is a cell in the crista galli. You can see that's the actual crista galli. You can see that this is a medial lamella. That's the lateral lamella. So depending on the, the, the most uh, vertical height of the lateral lamella to the medial lamella, that's the floor, the, uh, the cribriform plate, this is basically uh, gives an, us an estimate of what type of uh, cribriform skull base we are dealing with. If it is too long, if it is too long, basically, if it is too long, uh, this is the most dangerous uh, uh, situation where you can actually injure the skull base of the lateral lamella. If it's medial and if it's too uh, too small, or consider the vertical vertical height is too small, that's the most uh, safest uh, condition where we can uh, go for the surgery, where the injury is not that common. So that is basically the rough estimate. I, I do not actually go by uh, the numericals over here. That is up to uh, 1 to 3 mm, 4 to 7 mm, or 8 to 16 or 8 to 15 mm should be the classification. So if it is, uh, the, if the height is around less than 1 to 3, basically, it is the most uh, safest. If it is 4 to 7, it is moderate. And if it is around uh, 8 to 16, it is the most vertical height that can be uh, very hazardous for that. So more the height, the more the danger is there because uh, then the skull base will be low lying if the vertical height is too big and you may directly injure the skull base. So for me in this scan, at least uh, the skull base is safe. This is not very uh, lengthy. It is safe for me to operate uh, in this patient. So that is about the skull base. That is the cribriform plate. Uh, somewhere here, if you do an endoscopy, you will see the uh, be uh, between the septum, between the septum, and the uh, the middle turbinate. If you go, you will see uh, at the very top of it the yellowish pale mucosa. That is the olfactory receptors present in the olfaction area, the olfaction mucosa. So. If you injure that, definitely, if you if you injure that while performing a spinoid sinus opening with a medial approach, if you go too high, uh, the patient may have blockage over there because of some raw surface. Uh, or if you, uh, after opening the spinoid from the medial approach, if you medialize the middle turbinate too much on the septum superiorly, there will be no air passage and the olfaction will be completely uh, cut off from the... Uh, for the normal smell sensation will be gone. So this is basically rough anatomy of the of the cribriform plate over here and the height of the cribriform plate uh, depending upon the, the height of the lateral lamella. So the question is asked what that classification is based on what exactly? So that is basically on the height of the uh, the vertical height of the lateral lamina in respect to the, the base of the cribriform plate. Okay, so that is the crista galli. In cases of transcribriform approaches for olfactory neuroblastoma, we uh, we do a complete bilateral modified lothrops and we open the frontal sinus. We do a uh, opening of the the skull base over here in the transcribriform area. We eventually remove the olfactory uh, tract. There's the olfactory bulbs as well, and the the uh, we have to also remove. The crista galli. We have to do a removal of the crista galli uh, and cut the attachment of the fox cerebri off the tip of the crista galli above and remove that bone in cases of transcribriform surgery. So that is the importance of that in this situ situation. So after having known about, after having uh, explained about the the cribriform plate and the crista galli, the basics. I'll move on towards the. Uh, the more important part, which is the uncinate process, the maxillary sinus, and the osteomyantle complex. Okay, this is the most important thing, a uh, junior, if you are trying to perform a fest surgery in the most initial part of the career, they have to understand the basic anatomy of the osteomyantle unit. So now you can see that this is the maxillary sinus. That's the maxillary sinus over here, and this is completely non. Uh, doesn't show any opacification inside. This is completely normal. Uh, as we keep on going behind, you can see the, the maxillary sinus opening up here. I can see the osteomyatal opening over here. 
So for that to happen, we need to know uh, the anatomy of the unsignaled process. Now, already we discussed that this is the uh, the bulla et modalis, a huge anterior ethmoidal air cell. Uh, that's the uh, bulla et modalis, basically, which uh, dictates the anatomy of the frontal recess posteriorly. So if there is a huge uh, bulla et modalis, it can press anteriorly and reduce the opening of the frontal recess from behind. If there is a huge agar nasi air cell that can block the uh, frontal recess opening from the anterior aspect. So more big the uh, agar nasi is, you just have to break open the agar nasi and then you're directly in the frontal recess and the sinus eventually while performing surgeries. Okay. So in a lot of my videos, I have shown how to easily open the frontal sinuses. All the fest cases I keep on doing, I post it on my channel and I show how to actually open the frontal very easily. So going on behind, this is the unsignaled process, which is attached to the, the, the lateral nasal wall over here. The only movable part, which if you take a ball probe in your, in your OR in the patient and you touch it with the ball probe on the unsignaled, it, it, it moves like a flap in and out. So that's the only almost the movable structure on the lateral nasal wall. So how does it start basically? So if I go very anteriorly, you can see that's the inferior turbinate. That's the middle turbinate. You go on behind, you can start seeing a flap like structure over here. That's the unsignaled process basically. So unsignaled process has got two vertical, uh, one vertical part and one horizontal part. Okay. The vertical part keeps on going above, above, above. And you can see it has attachment over here to the medial boundary of the bulla et moidalis okay so it also has an attachment so basically now this is not bulla this this is this is wait 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 so we are now in the anterior aspect so if i go posteriorly this is agar nasi if i keep on going posteriorly this is bulla et moidalis and we cannot see any attachment of the unsignate over here but if i go anteriorly you can see that's the agar nasi air cell okay this was my so this was the appearance of the agar nasi air cell and if i keep on going behind behind you can see that's the middle turbinate and now if i go behind that's the that's the unsinate so if i follow the attachment of the unsinate you can see it is attached medially to the medial border of the agar nasi it goes above and it can have any attachment. It can attach to the skull base. It can attach to the, the middle turbinate over here, or it can attach to the lamina papyracea right here. So depending on the attachment levels of the unsignate process, the frontal sinus will either drain medially in, or sorry, either laterally in the sinus area, that's the infundibulum, or it will drain medially into directly the uh, ethmoidal area okay like this so in the nasal cavity so if you follow the unsignate over here it is attaching itself to the medial border of the agar nasi and then you can see it is having you can see that's the unsignate that's the unsignate going laterally and there it is attaching to the lamina papyracea so if we keep on going behind if you break this cell so what you have to do in this case frontal sinus you have to go medially Obviously, you're going to do your ansinectomy of the junction of the vertical and the horizontal process of the ansinate. You're going to open up the maxilla much more posteriorly. If I'm going posteriorly, you can see that's the horizontal process of the ansinate. That's the part of the vertical process. You're going to break the ansinate over here with your backbiting forceps and you're going to remove superior part of this area, make a large opening in the maxilla and you're going to be entering the maxilla inside. So, to open the patient's frontal on this side. Now, this is a bulla et moralis, so we are gone way behind. So, if I come anteriorly, so what I'm supposed to do is that I'm going to remove the entire vertical part of the unsignaled process. But before I do that, what I can do is I can go medially along the middle turbinate and medial to the unsignaled superior part. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take my ball probe and I'm going to hook it up here and go behind the cell and just gently tuck it anteriorly so it breaks open the agar nasi along with the superior part of the this is the unsignate process superior part 
it breaks open the entire process over here and I'm directly exactly into the frontal recess without any complications. Okay, or you can just take your micro debrider, take off this uncinate, take off this agaronase air cell and a little bit of uh, bulla behind, you can see the bulla behind and you can just enter in your, you know, the most posterior part of the frontal recess. And eventually you will be able to see the frontal sinus anteriorly and laterally. So this is how you have to approach and read your scan. So if you see on the left side, you're going to see that this is the uncinate process over here. That's the uncinate process. And if you keep on going behind, you can see the uncinate process attaching itself to the lamina papyracea. So in both the sides, the patient is having a medial drainage. You can see this is how. So if I keep on, this is a bull at modalis basically. So I, if I keep coming anteriorly, you can see the uncinate process having an attachment on the bulla over here in this case. And if I still come anteriorly, you can see this is the uncinate process going faintly attaching on the lamina papyracea. So if I keep on coming anteriorly, you can see that the this is the agarnesi air cell. And this patient is having definitely a medial drainage. If you break this open, the patient is having a medial drainage. But then if you if you carefully look at this side, you can see a faint opening over here. So this is the most posterior aspect of the frontal recess along with the supraorbital uh, recess area. It's draining medially. It has to drain medially. But if you see very closely over here, this case, it has got two attachments. You can see this is a middle turbinate, but you can see this is the uncinate, right? If I closely have a look, this is the uncinate. And here you can see it is attaching faintly to the uh, skull base over here, the cribriform, it has a cribriform attachment. So you can see this is the uncinate. It has basically a skull base attachment. So what can happen? It can have a lateral drainage. So you have to break open this area. If I keep on going posteriorly, that's the bull light modalis over there. So basically the uncinate is having here a skull base attachment. And then you can see the attachment over here of the agarnase air cell. So this is how you basically see the CT scan before your surgery and try to look for the attachment to know the basic uh, drainage of the frontal sinus. And you can have an estimate of how difficult or how easy your frontal sinus opening is going to be while in the OR. Also, you can take a sagittal scan and measure the diameter of the frontal recess from the anterior to the posterior part. So normally, the frontal recess should be of a diameter of around 1.2 to 1.5, okay, 1.2 to 1.5 frontal recess, that's 1.2 to 1.5 centimeters. If it is anything less than that, less than 1 or less than 0.7 centimeters, it is going to be really difficult, okay. So you can estimate before your surgery the, the dimension of the frontal recess because if you're going inside the surge inside the patient in the OR room and if you are just damaging the mucosa around the frontal sinus opening trust me that area is undergo uh, is going to undergo fibrosis and uh, if it is bony uh, if if there's any raw bone exposed because of all the mucosal damage the patient will have a long-term frontal sinus blockage that is called as iatrogenic frontal blockage which may lead to either mucosal or uh, uh, infection in the frontal sinus later on. So if you open the frontal sinus, be sure you open it up completely or you do not open that sinus at all, okay? So this was the basic anatomy of the, the agronasi the uncinate, the two parts of the uncinate, the vertical and the horizontal, the different attachments of the uncinate. So to understand all this, you have to have a bone window, not a soft tissue window. Soft tissue window is not going to show you any of the bony uh, inter bony margins at all. So now the most important thing left, now this is a bulla at Morales. We all know that we perform a intact bulla technique 
for preservation of the anterior ethmoidal artery. Now, if you're a junior watching this video or a surgeon who is very new to read a CT scan for such surgeries, uh, let me tell you, please listen to this very carefully. If you are operating in a case of chronic polyposis, severe ethmoidal polyposis, already having a presence of a huge supraorbital cell or pneumatization, the anterior ethmoidal artery is obviously gonna be under dissens. The canal will be dissent, uh, the artery will be hanging in the mesentery, the artery and the vein along, the, they are in the same canal, the artery and the vein. It's not just the artery, it's the artery and the vein. So basically, uh, I'm going to show you the anterior ethmoidal artery. It's right here. So this is the anterior skull base. Why I'm saying that this is the anterior skull base, I'm going to show you why. And then later on, I'll, I'll show you the anterior ethmoidal artery. Let me just zoom this out away so you can have a glimpse. So if I go on the very anterior aspect, you can see this is the brain starting over here. That's the frontal sinus on both sides. So if I'm going behind, behind, you can see a slant. That's the oblique slant. That's the oblique slant. So remember this. If you want, you can mug this up. You can just buy hard this. Anterior ethmoidal skull base, or you can just say the anterior ethmoidal skull base is always, always oblique. It is never horizontal. The moment you see the anterior ethmoidal artery, it is basically the most posterior part of the anterior ethmoidal skull base. The moment you see the anterior ethmoidal artery, let me just show you the anterior ethmoidal artery. That's the anterior ethmoidal artery on the right side. That's the anterior ethmoidal artery on the left side right now. Still, you can see it's oblique. It's not horizontal. But now, the exact area behind the anterior ethmoidal artery is basically what? posterior ethmoidal skull base so if i'm now going behind 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 now you can see it's no more oblique or i can say less oblique and now later on it's going to become more horizontal this is never oblique now this is going to become flat and more horizontal you can see it's ho horizontal and still this is the frontal bone this is frontal bone this is terion over here the terion over here this is a frontal bone over here and now eventually this is the orbital apex area will appear that's the inferior orbital fissure if i still keep on going behind you can still see the frontal bone over here that's the frontal bone over here and once see this is completely horizontal this is not oblique this is posterior ethmoidal skull base so oblique if you see oblique and the anterior ethmoidal artery it is anterior ethmoidal skull base if you see it is horizontal and behind the anterior ethmoidal artery, trust me, it is always and always posterior ethmoidal skull base. Now you can see it's fainting off, it's fading off. And now this is basically what? This is spinoid bone, this is lesser ring of spinoid right now. This is all brain over here. This is a temporal lobe coming on the picture right now. This is the orbital apex you can see over here now. And this is a proper lesser ring of spinoid. And then you can see this is a spinoid sinus. The moment you see the lesser wing of spinoid and this disappearing in between, you can say that with confidence that this is the spinoid sinus right here. Okay. And that's the most posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus. And that's the temporal lobe on the lateral aspect. That's the uncus of the temporal lobe. Uh, that's the orbital apex, which will continue posteriorly as a uh, superior orbital fissure, which will further continue as posteriorly cavernous sinus and uh, yeah so this is a spinoid this is proper spinoid in this case you can see the left spinoid is superiorly dominant the right is very small you can see if you open this patient's spinoid from the right side without knowing that so just so imagine this scenario so let me repeat this. So just imagine if you are uh, operating on such patients. So imagine this patient was having all collection here, sinusitis or some kind of uh, a tumor mass or whatever it is. And you're trying to open the spinoid, but you haven't seen the CT scan. You just posted the patient. You haven't seen the CT scan and you're going from the right side. Okay. You're going from the right side. Then only God will help you out. Because you can see 
If you're going from the right side, such a small spinoid sinus on the right side with a very thin interspinoidal septation over here. So you'll be all scared once you open the spinoid on the right side, you'll be like, it's a very small one, it's a very small one. And then you keep on trying opening on the other side, you may accidentally injure the lateral and the posterior wall of the spinoid, causing injury to the ICA, optic nerve and various uh, cavernous sinus area. Definitely, I'm so sure about it. But if you look at the scan, what you can do is, right, you can make a common opening on the posterior aspect. You can just follow the septum. This is a septum in the middle line. You're going to see the, the spinoid rostrum. This is the appearance of the spinoid rostrum right now. That's the rostrum area. What you can do is open the spinoid sinus from both the sides. Uh, take away the rostrum on the superior aspect. Then on the inferior aspect, you will encounter the keel of spinoid. Remove that as well. Open the left. Widen the left spinoid sinus and just take away the small interspinoidal septation, you will have a huge opening in the spinoid and you not you have nothing to worry about right now. All your structures will be intact and healthy. So this is how you basically approach. This is the ICA impression, that's the carotid impression. Now, in the previous video where I was talking about the HRCT temporal bone, I have shown you the exact course of the ICA in the petrous part of the temporal bone as it enters the carotid canal and exits through the foramen of lacerum or the superior part of it and then it continues as the paraclival and the para the cavernous you can see this is the anterior clinoid process right here that's the optic nerve impression so if you're a junior resident or an exam going resident they keep you spotters for the exam for five marks or again 10 marks depends on what college you are in or what university you are in so basically it should be five marks spotters you are given certain spotters which i'll talk about separately after some time after going through the basic anatomy so just for now remember that this is the area of the orbital apex inferior orbital fissure this is the area somewhere of the ICA, which we go behind, could be the cavernous sinus over here. That's the anterior clinoid process. That's the optic nerve cupping you can see over here. So we have a Delano classification for the optic nerve uh, classification or the, uh, the four gradings of the optic nerve pneumatization in the spinoid, basically. So I'll talk about that. That's called as Delano classification, D-E-L-A-N-O, Delano. Okay, so going on behind behind that's a huge spinoid which you can see right now and uh, still going behind you can see this is the optic nerve and the ICA that's the most important thing which you can ever see on a CT scan so coming back again uh, this is a proper spinoid so okay so this was how you basically look for the uh, the spinoid sinus and the rostrum and the keel so we've talked about so far the important uh, anatomical structures of the uh, the superior, middle, and the inferior turbinate, the the uh, the con uh, the bullet modalis, the agronasi ASL, how to approach the frontal sinus, how to see the uncinate process attachment, the anatomy of the uncinate process, the osteomyital unit, the the infundibulum. This is basically the infundibulum area, the hiatus uh, semilunaris inferioris. Then we go behind between the bulla. We can see the bulla over here. Uh, and between this basic the superior area is the hiatus semilunaris superioris, the hiatus semilunaris inferioris, we all know. Then if the patient is having a uh, pneumatization of the middle terminate, we call that as conca bullosa. We we have to operate that if we have to proceed without uh, injuring the mucosa. So we, we take a we take out the lateral lamella of the middle terminate, which I've shown in a lot of videos in my surgery. So that is called as basically lateral laminectomy, or you can say the conca bullosa, the conca plasti, basically. So if there is, uh, yeah, so that's that's all about that middle terminate. The weakest part of the skull base is the area where the anterior ethmoidal artery pierces. So I'm going to show you how to identify the anterior ethmoidal artery. So for that, I have to go very anteriorly. Now very quickly, have a close attention. Just pay your attention over here. 
So as we are going behind, keep your focus on the eyeball and the lateral, that is the medial wall, that is the lamina papyracea. So as we are going behind, behind, that's the ancinate, that's the middle turbinate, and that's the oblique uh, skull base over here. We are going behind, you can see that's the eyeball, and that's the intraconial compartment. You can test superior rectus, that's the medial rectus, that's the superior oblique muscle over there, that's the inferior rectus same on the left side still going behind behind you can you can see that the superior oblique and the medial rectus they come close to each other and then you can see a uh, uh, a nippling happening over here that is a basic narrowing and a small canal like structure will start coming out so we're still going behind behind and you can see an actual uh, a small canal like uh, which appears uh, to be like a nipple because it is a narrowing a bony projection coming out so you can see this is, that's the medial rectus and that's the uh, superior oblique right there and they are in very very close connection to each other at this particular area and you can actually see that's the uh, that's the the nippling happening over there and that is basically the bony canal for the anterior thmoidal artery and the vein and you can see that is going in the lateral lamella and that's the medial lamella. So you can see that the artery is going in the lateral lamella, piercing the lateral lamella, entering into the intracranial compartment. It gives off a branch over there, okay, which uh, supplies, I think, to the area of the fox cerebra. It gives a branch inside intracranially and uh, later on again comes out intranasally and eventually goes out to the dorsum. So this anterior ethmoidal artery is basically a branch of the ophthalmic artery. In a separate video, I have done a 3D model anatomy, which I have showed exactly the origin of the uh, ophthalmic artery from the carotid artery uh, intracranially, and how it passes on to the optic nerve and then takes a superior medial turn from lateral to medial and then eventually gives off different branches the anterior ethmoidal artery being one of them so that's the medial rectus that's the superior oblique and that's the anterior ethmoidal bony canal you cannot see as such the artery but you can see the bony canal and if there is some kind of dehiscence you will not be able to see the artery but just the soft tissue which is the uh, over that which is the basic the mesentery of the artery basically so we're going behind you can see uh, that's the artery on the left side now uh, that's the more horizontal area now and I'm going to show you the posterior ethmoidal artery and then I'm going to show you the optic nerve so still cannot see any nippling happening uh, still yeah you can see somewhat of canal like structure through which the soft tissue is going inside that is basically this is this is the posterior ethmoidal artery and we are still anterior to the spinoid sinus anterior wall and this is the most posterior aspect of the posterior ethmoidal cavity so this is basically what you can see over here is the posterior ethmoidal artery and if we still keep on going behind you can actually see a very fine soft tissue structure going inside now we all know that the anterior ethmoidal artery now let me show you the anterior ethmoidal artery again that's the anterior ethmoidal artery right there that's the skull base that's the brain tissue over here that's the skull base you can see a very small area of pneumatization over here that's still the area of the superior most uh, intranasal cavity so if you can see if there is some collection over here ethmoidal polyposis you come to this area you may even not know that the artery is there and you end up injuring the artery and that causes intraorbital hematoma or you can say sudden blindness if not drained or a lateral canthotomy is not done so you can still see it is hanging few millimeters off the skull base you can say it has to be three or four now i have a uh i'm gonna measure i'm gonna measure so now see i'm gonna measure this you see that 1.69 millimeters or you can say the roughly two millimeters 
from the skull base. You can actually see on your screen, it is saying that it is two millimeters below the skull base. So you have a margin of two millimeters that the artery is away from the skull base. So this is one point to remember, the anterior ethmoidal artery never runs inside the skull base, but the anterior ethmoidal artery runs few millimeters, could be two, could be three, or could be four, depending on the pneumatization of the, the frontal recess, the suprabullar, or you can see the supra or vital cells, etc, etc. So uh, in this case, we have it as two millimeters over here. So if we go on posteriorly, you can see the posterior ethmoidal artery is running in the skull base. This is always remember, the posterior ethmoidal artery runs in the skull base and not away from it, okay? So now that's the posterior ethmoidal artery on the left side. You can see it is running in the skull base, not away from it, it is in the skull base. You can see that's the artery which is running in the bone, that's the inside the skull base. That is one thing you always have to remember. So, the chances of injury to the posterior ethmoidal artery are almost next to rare, okay? And then you can have this optic nerve right here. So, we have this uh, 6, 12, and 24 rule, right? From the anterior lacrimal crest, the anterior ethmoidal artery is somewhere around 24 mm. Then from the anterior ethmoidal artery, the posterior ethmoidal artery is somewhere around 12 mm and from the posterior ethmoidal artery to the ophthalmic that is the optic nerve basically the is the optic nerve is basically 6 mm so the anterior lacrimal crest to the uh, the optic uh, nerve is basically 6 plus 12 plus 24 it's like that so that is how you differentiate uh, the the three the two arteries and the nerve behind okay so that is called as rule of 6, 12, 24. So I think that's the basic anatomy. Then I need to show you, let me just zoom this out. I need to show you the, uh, the more exam spotter point of view locations. So now, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go directly on the orbital apex area. So now this is the most anterior part. That is the medial rectus, the optic nerve. You can, that's the optic nerve you can see. That is not a muscle. Remember, this is not a muscle. This is basically optic nerve. If you follow this behind, 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 you can see my cursor. This is the optic nerve. This is the optic nerve, optic nerve, optic nerve. And this is the optic nerve. Here you see, that's the optic nerve right there. That's the optic nerve. So you can see that on MRI very, very clearly. That's the lateral rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, superior oblique, same thing on both sides. MRI is the best study to know the anatomy of the orbit or any intracranial lesion. So if I get time, I'll definitely put a MRI video separately after some time because I've already taken a lot of lectures on MRI before. So going on to the most posterior aspect of the orbit, that is the orbital apex area. You can see the temporal lobe coming here in the picture. Now concentrate on the inferior orbital fissure. The moment you see, this is an intact bone over here. That's the intact bone. The moment you keep on going behind, 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 you can see an opening over here. This opening is of the inferior orbital fissure, which is going on to the temporal area anteriorly. Then we are going to go still behind, behind, behind. And now this area, this is the inferior orbital fissure, which will be in connection to the pterygopalatine fossa that's the pterygopalatine fossa area here right here and then this is the infratemporal fossa area right here which is you can see behind the posterior wall of the maxilla so this is the maxilla still in picture so you cannot see any pterygopalatine fossa uh, unless the posterior wall of the maxilla is seen okay so this is a posterior wall of the maxilla behind which you can see the PPF and then lateral and anterior to it, you can see the infratemporal fossa. That's the temporal, so the infratemporal fossa you can see over here. So that almost, uh, you can see the connections of the orbit through the inferior orbital fissure in the temporal side, then the uh, pterygopalatine fossa and the infratemporal fossa uh, through which the IOF 
uh, the orbit connects okay so once the maxilla is done see this is the posterior wall of the maxilla you drill that you're going to get the ppf that's the inferior orbital fissure that's the temporal lobe over here you're going to see the foramen oval somewhere over here a slant opening you can see that's the area where you can see the foramen oval but that is way behind you have to retract the 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 the, ma the muscles in the infratemporal fossa and you can see the foramen oval transmitting the the uh, the mandibular nerve right there so that's the iof uh, in cases of jna it can erode the floor of the spinoid sinus and enter into the uh, spinoid sinus it can also enter through the inferior orbital fissure through the spinopatitan foramen and enter the orbit so one of the most common ways through which a jna can spread into the orbit is that the inferior orbital fissure now i'm going to show you the spinopalatine canal right there so on a scan i'll show you on the left side so on a scan just keep on following the the maxillary sinus and the most posterior this is the most posterior aspect of the maxillary sinus that's the posterior wall of the sinus you can see an opening so as soon as the sinus ends you can see behind that the pterygopalate and fossa but through which you can see a opening over here right here this opening is basically the spinopalatine foramen through which the spinopalatine artery exits and i've shown you a vi uh, i've shown a video previously where exactly how you can actually lift the the periosteum and how you can see the artery running behind the posterior wall of maxilla and coming out through the uh, spinopalatine foramen so this is a the area of the foramen right there if i still keep on going behind that is gonna fuse up and that's the perpendicular plate of the palatine and then behind you can see that's the uh the entire this is the entire spinoid board so this is a greater wing of spinoid that's the greater wing of spinoid anteriorly if we go that's the uh the lesser wing of spinoid this is the lesser wing of spinoid this is a spinoid sinus cavity proper. That's the inferior orbital fissure. That's the orbital apex. That's the temporal lobe. If you keep on going behind, that is the pterygopalatine fossa. Laterally, the infratemporal fossa. And anteriorly is the temporal side. The soft tissue and the muscles of mastications are seen here. And uh, this is how this is the external area where the cheek is connected. That's the cheek in JNA. This is a spread. If it's too laterally, you can see a bulge in the cheek right here. So, yeah. So behind this we go, that's the greater wing of spinoid. That's the, uh, the coenal area. That's the keel of spinoid basically below and anteriorly. So that's the rostrum and that's the keel below right there. That's the keel. So you have to take this away if you are doing a pituitary surgery for a common opening in the spinoid to have a greater inferior access without any instrumentation uh, problems. So that's the canal. Yeah. So this is a greater wing of spinoid and we can see the pterygoid wedge over here. That's the pterygoid uh, body. You can see the bone marrow right here, the bone marrow right here. That's the medial pterygoid plate. That's the lateral pterygoid plate. You get pterygoid venous plexus over here. Uh, a lot of times JNA spreads over here and that is mostly if the JNA has an origin or, or the spread in this area and if you do not drill out the wedge, uh, it, it's going to keep on recurring again and again. So that is the medial pterygoid plate which forms the lateral boundary of the coena. So if you have a coenal atresia, you have to see whether that is a bony atresia or a cartilaginous or you can say a membranous atresia. So if it's a membranous atresia, it's okay. But if it's a bony atresia, you have to drill this entire bone, which could be coming from the, the medial pterygoid plate or the extension of the medial pterygoid plate. You can uh, make a common posterior opening by doing a septectomy and you make a, uh, a mini Haddad flap, split that uh, flap in two, and then you can just uh, reposit and cover the bony raw area and have a good wider opening behind that is how you basically repair on cases of coronal atresia on one side and both sides as well so this is the the pterygoid wedge now i'm going to show you a lot of confusion here is there 
uh, between the median and the uh, the maxillary nerve. I don't know if it's very clear on this scan, but I'll try to show you if at all I see, I'm able to see it. Yeah, you can see it over here. That's the pterygoid wedge. That's the pterygoid body, basically. Uh, that's the entire spinoid sinus here. That's the anterior conoid, the anterior uh, anterior clinoid process, the optic and the carotid over here. You can see this is the soft tissue circle of foramen you can see over here. And you can see a canal over here. The same thing you can see over here and here. Somewhere here. This is the canal uh, here and this is the canal over here. I think this is a slightly tilted scan. That is why it is not symmetrical on both sides. So yeah, you can see a canal structure over here and you can see a canal structure over here. Now, I always tell this, I don't know, I cannot stress this enough more, is that uh, median is median. Still, I see a lot of people out there getting confused which is median and which is lateral. Trust me, if I'm saying this, median is median. It is so rhyming, right? So, median, this is a median canal. On the pterygoid wedge, the pterygoid body, the medial one near the coena is basically the vidian canal. So V I D I A N is vidian, M E D I A N median. It rhymes. So vidian is median. Always remember that. You'll never forget that. Vidian is median. So it is medial. Always remember that. And this, the one which is more superior and lateral, is obviously the foramen rotundum which carries the maxillary nerve of the trigeminal nerve, okay? So this is median median and this is the foramen rotundum. That is the maxillary nerve. So always, I think you shouldn't be forgetting now this at all ever in your life. So that is basically the uh, two canals and the spinoid sinus. I think roughly you can see this is the intraspinoidal septations over here. If you keep on following the anterior, then it becomes the posterior clinoid process and the dorsum cella over here and the clivus. So this is what you can see over here is the clival bone. You can drill the clival bone, keep on going behind, behind. You can start seeing the, the vertebrae over here. That's the, that's the vertebral body behind. So the atlas and the axis. So you can see the atlas and the axis and you can see the, uh, the odontoid process of the axis over here. And that's the clival posterior most aspect, uh, which you go for the cervical decompression area. So if I still keep on going behind the clivus, you can see the brain stem, which I have shown in my cadaveric dissection videos where I've done the skull based cadaver dissection. And I've shown all the approaches and we can easily see the basilar artery, the brain stem and all the cranial nerves behind. So basically, this is, this is how you identify the uh, structures on the CT scan. So if at all you are not aware of the, the basic anatomical structures, you should be aware. And this is how you basically read a scan. So let me just see real quick what have I missed so far. So I cannot see any Haller cell in this case. Normally the Haller cell is inferior medially to the orbit right here. This is the orbit, that's the maxilla. So the Haller cell should be somewhere over here inferior medially to the orbit. But this patient doesn't have. What you can see over here, this faint structure like a canal, this is nothing but the infraorbital nerve, which I've already shown in a lot of my surgical videos that runs along the floor of the orbit and comes outside through the inferior orbital fissure. And then it uh, runs uh, for some time, it exits from the uh, infraorbital canal which is roughly 5 mm below the floor of the orbit. So if I can trace this anteriorly, you can see that's the nerve coming out of the external part of the skin. So that's the infraorbital nerve, and that goes posteriorly. Uh, it comes from the pterygoparitan fossa. That's the nerve you can see right there. It comes from the pterygoparitan fossa behind right here somewhere. So this is how you basically look at the anatomy. What else is left? Skull base dissense, CSF leaks. The, in this patient, all the skull base bone is intact. Then uh, that's the maxillary bone. 
you can see the denture the, the, the dentition over here in cases of uh, cysts or abscesses are having odontogenic odontogenic origin uh, you can see a cyst or a tooth stuck over here a lot of times you get cases like that so you can have a basic uh, cbct especially done for that there is a cone beam ct for higher studies so that gives you a much more detailed anatomy dentigerous cyst and all that cases we get keep on getting so keeping on be so i'm going behind so we've done the arteries the basic anatomy the sinus over here the orbit that's the infraorbital nerve so i've done a i've done a lot of videos where i've shown the orbital decompression so that is also taken care of the skull base the septum the turbinates the anatomy of the osteomedial complex the orbit so if when i do an mri scan i'm going to show you all the structures the soft tissues much more clearly which will be helpful for you in skull base surgeries and not in normal face surgeries but in skull base surgeries mri is useful in cases of inverted papilloma tumors in the sinonasal cavity vascular tumors like in capillary hemangioma and big tumors like that but for normal cases the ct scan is enough for you i don't think i've left anything if you feel i've left anything please comment in the section below and i can try to help you out there in that section so i hope you understood a lot of things from this video uh if you have any doubt or any questions i have missed you can please let me know on the comment section below or you can reach out to my instagram page or my facebook page um and whatever doubts you have you can just directly inbox me on my instagram or my facebook okay so thank you so much